Amen. God is good. And all the time. All right, good. I had to do a little heat check in here this morning. Because I know it's cold outside. But I know where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. You know, the the prophet Jeremiah put it this way. He said, it's like fire. Shut up in my bones. If I was in another setting, I might say it with a little more emphasis. Because it's here, I'm going to let y'all live. (laughs) But God is indeed good, and we all get to be here today, and that's good news. Uh, For those of you who are visiting for the first time, I don't know if we have any new visitors this service, but we did earlier. Uh, My name is Joshua Manning. I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here. And we are so glad that you guys decided to join us for worship this morning. I shared with the 930 crowd or gathering. I don't think think crowd is a good word for that. (laughs) The 930 gathering, small group, uh, the 930 small group that I... uh, (laughs) that I really do appreciate that early service because it is not live streamed. It's recorded. So if, if Zach ever wanted to uh, pull up some bloopers or anybody on the media team wanted to pull some bloopers, they could. But because it's not live streamed, I say a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't really make it elsewhere. Uh, and I really do appreciate that group for that. So, uh, 11, I'm going to try to be more transparent with you. Is that okay? Absolutely. Try to be, I'm trying to be better at that uh, here in this gathering. But for the past couple of weeks, we have been going through some of the post-resurrection accounts of Jesus, the times in which he appeared to people, people that knew him very well and had a hard time recognizing him <laughs> when he appeared. And Jesus comes and he reveals himself to them so they can, they can take hold of this good news that death does not have the final word. And not only that they can take hold of that good news, but so they can be invited into something more. So you can be invited into something more. And so we are actually in the last Sunday of looking at these accounts. And this Sunday, we are going to finish... The Gospel of John. We have gospel, We have John chapter 21, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 19. We're going to finish reading through the gospel, and we are going to complete this story as the gospel writer intended, hopefully. I wasn't born then, nor do I speak the original language. I just went to seminary. Okay? And uh, we're going to try to do this work together. So, uh, When you prepare, though, your hearts and minds to hear, you might notice something very familiar in this text. Speaking of that, there are times in our lives where we experience the phenomenon called deja vu. And I'm not talking about Beyonce, right? But the phenomenon called deja vu, where it's almost as if When you're experiencing a moment for the first time, it's almost as if you've been there before. Right? Sometimes we have dreams that almost act as premonitions, right? Like you have a dream and the next day you wake up like, you know, I could have sworn I was here before. Or like I had a dream about this and I I didn't know for certain it was going to go this way. (laughs) But it was sort of a premonition. And as you read this text, you may notice and experience a sense of deja vu, because chances are you've heard it before, but you probably haven't heard it this way. So the gospel according to John, chapter 20 run, we're gonna read verses one through 19, and I'm going to do my best to make this exciting for you to listen to. All right, it's 19 verses. I'm gonna read from the New Revised Standard Version. So if you are following along on your smartphone or in your Bible, just know uh, that It'll be a different translation if you do not, do not have the NRSV in front of you because there now is an updated edition of the NRSV. And so I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version, Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Listen now for a word from the Lord. 
After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. We'll deal with that later. <laughs> But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about 100 yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. And so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And then Peter answered, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. In parentheses, he said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to him, follow me. Follow me. This is the word of God for people of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and we give you praise for the ways in which we have already experienced your presence here today through song and through praise, through exchanging greetings and pleasantries with one another, through nourishment and caffeine. God, you show up in our lives in so many different ways. And God, as we are preparing to hear from you, Open up our hearts and our minds to receive what your spirit is saying to the church. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. Speak to our situations. Speak to our circumstances. Speak to our fears. Speak to our doubts, our uncertainties, and our anxieties. God, you know that we need to hear directly from you. And because we need to hear directly from you, I ask that you allow me to play the background as you take center stage. Not my words, but your words. Not my will, but your will be done. It's in the name that is above all names, we pray. Amen. Well, Peter 
has found himself in quite the situation. He and the other disciples, as we discovered over the past couple weeks, have a hard time trying to figure out what to do with themselves. They spent three years, day and night, with Jesus. He appears on the scene. John the Baptist says, there's one coming who I'm not worthy to even tie his shoes or his sandals. I don't want to paraphrase too much. <laughs> I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. That one, he's the Lamb of God. And they're like, all right, well, I guess that's who we're going to follow. I'm, I'm just saying in the Gospel of John. <laughs> that's what we're going to follow. So we're going to go follow him. And for three years, they followed Jesus around. And wherever Jesus decided to go, that's where they went also. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. So much so that the, when Jesus asked, are you guys going to leave me too? The 11 or 12 at the time looked around and said, well, where are we going to go? If we leave you, where are we going? Right? So for three years, you can imagine that they just went and did whatever Jesus asked them to do. He was like, well, I want to go from this side of the lake to the other side of the lake. They were like, all right, well, I guess we're going to the other side of the lake. Or Jesus would say, all right, well, we're going to go visit Lazarus's tomb. They said, oh, you're going to raise a dead man? He was like, yeah. And they were like, all right, well, I guess we're going to go raise a dead man. Right? They, and wherever Jesus went was where they were going. And when you do that for three years, when you don't think for yourself for three years and you just follow intently, it is easy to forget a couple of things, but mostly that you have agency. And so, some time after Jesus has died and is resurrected, they've seen him twice by now, based on what the gospel writer says. They've seen him twice by now, and finally decide, well, maybe we should make a decision for ourselves. You know, Peter, Peter's like, I'm going to go fishing. Now, there are a bunch of layers to that. But for those of us in today's world, fishing could be considered a form of recreation or relaxation. And when you've been through some things, it's very important for you to take some time to breathe. When you've been through some things, it's important to take some time to rest and to relax. But Peter was returning to what he knew. Because before Jesus appeared on the scene, Peter was what? Look at that. You guys can talk back to me. There we go. We're, we're Peter was a fisherman. And then Peter became a fisher of people. I really do appreciate this story. Because Peter returns back to what he knows because he's been through some stuff. And other disciples are like, well, I guess we're going with you because Jesus is not here to tell us what to do. So we're going to go with you. <laughs> right? So they go and they go fish. And they do it. They, they fish all night long. And as they're fishing all night long, wouldn't you know it, they didn't catch a darn thing until they receive a set of instructions from a man who's on the beach and say, y'all haven't caught anything, have you? And they're just like, oh, no. And calls them children, which I really, it's like, it's just really, it could be a term of endearment, but you know, some of us, because we live for so long, like, who are you calling a child? <laughs> and so Jesus calls them children, and they, and they respond and say, no, we haven't caught anything. He says, well, drop your net on the right side. Remember, Peter returned to what he knew. And you're telling me, if Jesus gives this, he gives this recommendation, if you will, or this feedback, suggestion, says, drop your net on the right side. And no one responds by saying we did that already. <laughs> and do you know why no one responds by saying we did that already? Because they probably did the same thing all night, getting frustrated that it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. They returned to what they knew, right? Assuming they returned to what they knew. They spent all night doing the same thing the same way, getting no results, and nobody, apparently, based on here on the gospel writer's uh, representation, nobody thought to just switch the side of the boat that they were dropping nets on, that they were fishing on. And I think the disciples model for us something healthy here. 
Do you know what they do when they get this suggestion? They try it. They don't say, we were doing this all night while you were sitting here on the beach. So forget you, it didn't work. We're going home, we're packing our net and we're going home. They didn't do that. Nor did they say, we're professionals. You're not. And go to this side. They didn't say, we're professionals, you're not. How dare you tell us where to drop this net? They just try it, which is very important for all of us here today. And, and I'm, speaking from, I'm speaking to myself, right? Sometimes when you've been trying something and it's not working, you're not getting the results you've been looking for, and a, a piece of feedback, sometimes constructive criticism, sometimes it's just a recommendation, is given, it's okay to receive it without trying to defend the fact that, it didn't, that your methodology didn't work. It's okay to receive feedback or suggestion without trying to defend the fact that what you were doing wasn't working. And when they drop the net something different happens. I really, I, I want to tell you this, I really do appreciate this. One of the reasons I appreciate this is because you guys know in today's world how many Zoom calls they would have had to have to get everyone on the same page to make the adjustment. It's just an adjustment. You know what I mean? conversations they would have had, how many stamps of approval they would have had to get just to go try the thing differently. Jesus gives this to them and they go do it. And it begins to work. And when it works, the disciple who Jesus loved, when you guys read the rest of the story, y'all know, y'all figure out who that is. I promise it's not a secret. If I was writing a book, about my parents, I'm the one that they love the most, okay? Just want to be very clear. I'm everybody's favorite. Um, is, is the camera still on? It's probably actually true. I just want to be clear about it. All right, anyway. So uh, they do that. John figures out it's Jesus because something miraculous is taking place. John calls out to Peter, it's the Lord. Peter's like, bet, I'm out. The same way they both ran to the tomb is the same way that Peter needs to go see. And so Peter needs to go see so bad that he decides to put some clothes on. I know what you're all thinking, why would he take his clothes off to fish? I don't know, but here's what's really important. <laughs> I think there, there, are couple, there are a couple of layers here, right? One of the most important layers here is that Peter decides to put something on before he presents himself to the Lord. Yeah. Two layers here. It seems very similar to what happens in the book of Genesis. Where... Adam and Eve, with newfound knowledge, have found themselves in a situation where they feel some type of way about their appearance. And so they make some clothes out of fig leaves, right? Is what we were told. And when God comes looking for them because they were in hiding, they pop out and God's like, what are you, what are you wearing? What do y'all have on? I really wish we were in the early 2000s because I just keep hearing in my head, what are those? I just keep hearing that in the back of my head, right? But Jesus has a similar interaction with Peter. But back, back to the, the story real quick. The reason they put something on is because they said to God, well, we were naked, right? And they're like, well, who told you that? Who told you that the way you are already wasn't good enough to approach me. And many of us 
has spent much of our lives believing the same lie. That who we are isn't good enough to present to God. That we must put on the proper attire and or the proper way of being a Christian or, if you will, faithful or righteous so that God will be willing to receive us. And the question I have for each of us today is, who told you that? That you needed to look a certain way before you could engage the Lord. Peter, though, puts clothes on and has shame and guilt, probably. I'm, I'm really, this is just exegesis here. And some people will call it eisegesis, but I beg to differ. Peter, if you guys remember, does something that could have caused a rift between him and Jesus. Because when he was asked whether or not he was part of Jesus' crew, he denies it three separate times. just so that he would not face a similar fate, right? And just out of fear, right? I mean, honestly, any of us, just self-preservation, we all of us might be like, I don't know that person. What do you mean? You're not going to kill me too. But Peter very likely is experiencing some level of guilt and shame, but he runs to Jesus. He just needs to make sure he's presentable before he gets there. And how many of us have allowed our feelings of shame and guilt to make us and invite us to put on airs for God when God already knows everything that's going on underneath. That seems incredibly counterintuitive to try to present yourself as one thing to someone who knows you better than you probably even know yourself. So Peter puts on his clothes, and then gets in the water, which I think is also counterintuitive. That's a conversation for another day. And then he pops up, and he, and he gets to the shore when everyone else gets there. And then when they get there, Jesus invites them to have breakfast. So not only were, were they returning back to what they knew, they are then taking a moment to replenish themselves. And when they get there and they sit down with Jesus, they just sit in silence because no one wants to say the thing which is, who's this? I have some inclination. I believe it might be, but I don't really want to say that because it doesn't look like it to me. Right? I was with the man for three years. It doesn't look the same, whatever the case may be, right? I have a lot of like pop references going through my brain right now. And it's like, reminds me of Austin Powers, gold member. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mole. <laughs> and, so, and so anyway, I, I'm sorry, guys. Stuff, ha stuff happened in my brain this morning. But anyway, uh, so they're sitting here. Nobody wants to say the thing. So nobody says anything. When they finish eating, though, this is just absolutely one of those things where if you are this type of person, you understand what's happening between Jesus and Peter. Sometimes when there's some strife between you and another person, you just have to hash it out. And I believe this is actually an opportunity for them to begin to hash some stuff out. Although, I think Peter's idea about it and Jesus' idea about it are two different things. Does it make sense? Like, you, ever, you have ever done something wrong to somebody and they're like, they start asking you questions that have nothing to do with what happened, but you know they're checking to see if y'all are good or not? And so here, Peter gets asked by Jesus three separate times, do you love me? And Peter keeps saying, well, you know I love you. You know I love you. You know I love you. And Jesus, honestly, I don't want to project onto Jesus. I just want to say this. If it was me, I'd be sitting there saying, I'm asking you because based on your behavior, I can't tell. <laughs> like, I, I'm asking you because based on what I've seen from you, I can't tell. Right? <laughs> so I was like, do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter's like, Peter's like just frustrated and offended. It's just so interesting to me that Peter would get offended at Jesus asking him whether or not his feelings are valid, right? Or he actually loves him based on how Peter has mistreated or disregarded that relationship in the past. I don't think there's anything wrong with posing a question. 
And Peter getting frustrated just is what it is in that regard. And so as Peter's getting frustrated, Jesus is asking, and I believe they're beginning to hash some stuff out. And I, and I really wish I had some time for a word study this morning. Because if you read this in the Greek, you would understand why Peter's getting frustrated. Peter's not just getting frustrated because Jesus is asking, do you love me three times? It's because Jesus actually starts... I'm going to have to do it. All right, so <laughs> when Jesus is talking to Peter and they're exchanging with one another, Jesus is actually making distinctions in the type of love that Peter might have for him. I'm already a long preacher, so I'm really trying to not do this. Okay, but he's making distinctions in the type of love that Peter has for him, which is why Peter's getting really frustrated. Like, do you love me, love me, or you just love me? That's a good way of thinking about it, right? Yeah. It's like, yes, no, maybe. Peter's like, well, yeah, of course I love you. He's like, no, no, do you love me, love me? Peter's like, well, of course I love you, love you. And so as they have this conversation, Jesus gives him an instruction and invites him into something, which is to feed my sheep, tend to my sheep, feed my sheep. And I think this is super important because it teaches us something about how God relates to us. Even if we are experiencing shame and guilt about how we have conducted ourselves in the past. You guys ready for it? You, Jesus, after all this, says to Peter, you responded in the affirmative three separate times. I've given you not only a set of instructions, but I'm going to ask you one more time to follow me. And the reason I think that's super important is because sometimes there are seasons in our lives where we feel like our relationship with God is absolutely just non-existent, right? And or the way we have conducted ourselves is if we don't know and don't understand and have no relationship with the divine has caused us to have a sense of shame and guilt and we'd rather not. And yet Jesus teaches us through this interaction that God's invitation to us is always open. That God gives us an open invitation. That's, that honestly is amazing to me. Because we have been taught time and time again that God at some point in time is just over us. <laughs> and if Jesus should have been over anybody, it was that man named Peter. And some other folks who did some things, and he just said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus, the invitation is always open. And Jesus just says to him, follow me. So Peter not, has, not only has an opportunity to reconcile his relationship with Jesus, but then Jesus invites him to reclaim the relationship and reclaim the call that was already placed on his life to begin with, which is something that's super important. Because I don't know about you, I'm one of those people that probably just like, I've been trying to do the thing since I was really young, so I, I don't really have recollection of a, like an extended period of time in which I just acted like I didn't know God or didn't know what God had called me to. But I can look over my life and see that there are some periods in time in which like it just felt like there's no way I can, get, I can get to the next thing. There's no way I can absolutely move forward. Based on how I behaved, I can't move forward from here. God is not interested in me doing X. God is darn sure me not interest, interested in me becoming an ordained minister based on how I conducted myself. I'm not saying anybody, any, y'all all called to ordained ministry. I'm just, helping, <laughs> just like understanding. All Christians are called to ministry. In, in, I sound like a New Yorker there. I said called. All right. <laughs> Woo. All Christians are called <laughs> to ministry in unique ways. And no matter what rift you feel like has been in a relationship between you and God, God is still inviting you to follow. It's still inviting you to be a part of sharing the good news and of helping to care for others the same way that somebody cared for you, to pray for others the same way that somebody prayed for you, to walk with others the same way that somebody walked with you. And the last thing I want to share with you he is. Jesus invites him, letting him know, essentially, that there's some things about being faithful to what God has called you to, and there's some parts of that that are unavoidable. That in many ways, 
choosing to say yes is kind of choosing to relinquish a part of your agency. He says to Peter, you know, one day somebody's going to tell you where to go and what to do. I almost thought he was talking about itinerancy in the United Methodist Church. I almost, I almost thought he was talking about that. But one day somebody's going to tell you what to do and where to go. And when they do that, it's going to cost you your life. But don't be discouraged. Because of your yes, and even before your yes, I will always be with you. And that's good news for every single one of us today. That God does not abandon us. That when we say yes to God, it also means we're saying yes to some other things. And I don't really have time for this at this service, but one of the things to consider too is that when you read the rest of this story, and please do go home and read it, it's five verses. Like literally, I'm, we're almost at the end of the Gospel of John. Five verses. You read the next five verses, you'll see that when Peter gets this uh, sort of word of caution from Jesus or a warning from Jesus, he looks around at John. He's like, but what about him? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus is like, I'm not talking to him. I'm talking to you. And sometimes I think we want our lives to look like someone else's. And yet, there are certain challenges that each of us are going to face. It doesn't mean that other people aren't being faithful because their lives may not be as hard. (laughs) Or the thing that God has called them to may not seem as stressful. But it does point out the fact that what God has for each of us is uniquely for us. And it still brings all of us into a future where the kingdom of God is being made on earth as it is in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.